This is Conversations on Careers and Professional Life, a podcast from the Foster School of Business, MBA Career Management Office. I'm your host, Gregory Heller. On each episode, I talk with guests from faculty and staff to students and business leaders about the skills and strategies that can help you design a professional life that you're happy with. On this episode, I have a conversation with Sam Yushio, founder of Ikigai Lab, host of the Ikigai Stories podcast, and fellow Gallup certified strengths coach. Sam and I had this conversation in February of 2021, and it will appear on both of our podcasts. It's a longer conversation than most I share, but I think it's a good one. We talk about how we both got to where we are today, the Japanese concept of Ikigai, well-being, purpose, and meaning. Sam also asks me about how students use Clifton Strengths and whether more students are seeking out purpose-driven companies or impact careers. I hope you enjoy this conversation on careers and professional life with Sam Yushio. Welcome to Conversations on Careers and Professional Life, Sam. Thank you, Gregory. And I guess I should say welcome to Ikigai Stories. It's a home and home series here. Yeah, I am. Uh, I am excited to be uh, to be on Ikigai Stories. You've had some fantastic <laughs> guests, and I've enjoyed listening to a number of the episodes. the uh, The Happiness Curve episode, I think, was a highlight for me, and I would encourage anyone to go and listen to that. I think one of the interesting things, Sam, is that you and I are both in a similar stage of life. We both are in our forties. We both have children who are in the beginning of their elementary school careers, early in their elementary school careers. And I think we have both come to this calling or avocation of helping people uncover what is the most, the highest and best and most impactful activities that they engage in and the way they engage in those activities also around the same time. Yeah. What is your journey to this point been like? Like, tell us what you were doing before that, like that, where the switch flipped. Yeah. Um, well, I love the way that you set that up, Gregory. And we do have a lot in common, both professionally and personally, in our perspective on on the world and probably the definition of purpose. My path to where I'm at today started probably the the one of the key inflection points um, was 20 years working in corporate America in the financial services uh, asset management space. And part of that work was leading a management consulting team that coached, we would coach approximately a thousand financial advisors per year. And so in doing that work, I was observing the word growth everywhere in the industry. uh, But that word was always singularly defined by financial growth. It was about growing the portfolio or growing the value of the business. And that started to chip away at me um, that there wasn't as much representation on professional growth and personal growth was pretty much non-existent. That started to chip away from my you know, perspective and then it eventually forced reflection and the acknowledgement that my pattern of decision making is the exact same. Most of my decisions are Financial growth motivated, very little professional, next to nothing personal. That was especially acute when uh, my wife and I had our third child. And so I'm jumping on planes and leaving the family to go give presentations. And and um, I just came, there was, a, there was a moment actually on my calendar two days ago. I've got the Chase Real Rabbits anniversary. It's the four-year anniversary of um, this moment in my life where I made the decision to uh, chart a different path. The short version of that is I walked into a to a ballroom in Midtown Manhattan for a financial services conference, 800 people or so. Uh, and the last presenter of the day was an ethics professor from Denver University named Corey Chietti. And he told, uh, here's a condensed version of, of how he opened his presentation. He basically said, the world's most successful greyhound dog is named Cash. On the evening of Cash's biggest race, the owner pats Cash on the head and says, tomorrow's big race. You're going to win a ton of money, fame, fortune, power, influence. Cash looks up at the owner, says, I'm not going to run the race. I'm retiring right now. The owner says, well, what do you mean? And, and Cash, the dog, says, well, I've 
I, I'm going to win tomorrow. You're right. I'm unstoppable. I've got power, money, fame, influence. What I always trying to do is catch that rabbit. And I just found out that the rabbit is fake. And then Corey looks out into this audience of 800 financial professionals and says, most of you are living that life. And to me, that really brought it to life, like this inner feeling of, you know, this gap between financial, professional and personal growth. And at that point, uh, four years ago on February 10th, 2017, that was it. And I started to chart my course from there. So that's, that's, um, you know, one of the, the, the most important points, probably the next chapter, the, the short version of this chapter that we've talked about before is a very uh, personal and meaningful story to me and my family. Um, my great grandmother uh, overcame significant uh, sacrifice and hardship um, to preserve the legacy of an ancient 1200 year old shrine in, in Fukuoka, Japan. And she had two sons on both sides of the war, uh, one of which was my grandfather, who was a decorated uh, U.S. Uh, military or uh, in, in the U.S. military. Um, my, he, she had a, a, a son in the Japanese army who passed away uh, in combat. And um, I found this story at a, at a very important point in my journey. And um, it helped me understand the meaning of purpose, like doing something more beyond self, sacrificing, uh, in her case, to preserve the legacy of this ancient 1,200-year-old Shinto shrine uh, where her, her husband was, uh, my great-grandfather was to be the 48th consecutive generational head priest, um, but also these two families that are on both sides of the war. So that was kind of a, a, a long-winded way of saying there were you know, two key moments in my life that really started to started to craft my journey to purpose and strengths and this Japanese philosophy called Ikigai. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Tell us about Ikigai. Uh, so Ikigai is a uh, Japanese philosophy. It's about a thousand years old that can be interpreted as your reason for being or your purpose. Uh, it's the derivative of two words, iki, which means life, and gai, which means value or worth. If you Google it, you're going to find a four-circle Venn diagram. And unfortunately, I think that four-circle Venn diagram creates more problems than it does solutions because it connects your purpose to employment, which is something that we should, we should definitely talk about. Um, that's one of the scenarios. That's not all the scenarios. Uh, Really, if you look at your reason for being through the Japanese perspective from psychology and sociologists, psychiatrists, the research over there, um, it you know connects to longevity, creativity, happiness, uh, and is really about gratitude, being in the moment, identifying and aligning your actions with your priorities. So that's that's uh, you know the short version, the Cliff Notes version. Of Ikigai. Okay. Um, the Venn diagram, right? It shows the, it's like the what you love, what you're good at, what the world needs and what you can get paid for, right? Right. right. And it's the what you can get paid for part that that maybe is a little um, strays from the origins of the concept. Correct. Correct. Yeah. So the where Ikigai really hit the Western uh, radar was in 2004, 2005. There was an author named Dan Buettner. Uh, so he was a National Geographic researcher, wrote a book and published an issue in National Geographic called The Blue Zones. So he wanted to find out where do people live longest in the world, found five areas in the world. One of those areas was Okinawa, Japan. And that's where he discovered this philosophy, this life, life philosophy called Ikigai. And coincidentally, it's where um, Women live longest in the world. And so Butner was interviewing these, you know, centurions. And these centurions, in reference to their ikigai, were not talking about what they're doing for their job at 103 years old. They were not talking about what they were right. doing for their job 50 years ago. Uh, they were talking about, you know, the, the present moment and, you know, the, the, op the gifts and t uh, opportunity to connect with others and share their gifts and talents and services, something bigger than themselves. 
So that's where there are people who have that opportunity to connect purpose with, uh, with their job or with how they get paid. But I think that's, that's, that's a, a small minority of people. And so that four circle Venn diagram, unfortunately creates a little bit more problems than it does solutions. Because if someone walks into their job and they don't feel fulfilled and they're looking at that four circle Venn diagram, then they think that they're not living their purpose. Even though when they leave that job, they may have rich relationships with family and friends and they're doing, they're, they're active in their communities and active in hobbies. And right. So that's, that's, that's my, my personal rub with the four circle Venn diagram. I actually call it the Ikigai myth. Yeah. You know, I think that uh, Bill Burnett and Dave Evans, who are the authors of Designing Your Life and now the book Designing Your Work Life, they address this with a two circle Venn diagram that has one circle. It's like, you know, uh, what you get paid to do, right? And, um, what you love to do, I think are the two circles, right? And they're like, they don't have to be, they don't actually have to overlap, right? <laughs> yeah. You can get paid to do yeah. something. And then outside yeah. of work, you can do the things that are really meaningful to you. And the job right. can be this means to an end that is separate. It doesn't have to be uh, everything wrapped into one. Right. Yeah, I love it. Well, and, and the concept that I'm, I'm sure you're well versed in of um, job crafting, right? That yeah. gives you a lot more agency in that circle and the job circle or what you get paid to do circle that really unlocks a whole different set of tools and perspectives to, to walk into work with a different mindset to show up differently or find relationships that help you show up differently, et cetera. Um, right. It's sort of a mindfulness even. Yeah. Yeah. So this is a home and home. Right. You, you, yeah. you put on, you put on, I've the been driving. Yeah. you've been driving. So yeah. let me, let me, uh, turn the, turn the tables on you. How about you? Can you, can you share your, your journey to, to this spot? Yeah. I, I don't have the, the neat 20 year in one career before arriving at this thing that I love to do. I started out working in politics and community organizing in New York City while basically while still in, college there at NYU, got my master's in public administration at NYU, and then went to work for an organization called ACORN. And I was working on issues like living wage, which unfortunately is still something that is we are, we are fighting for with the uh, fight for 15 and $15 minimum wage you know, advocacy that's going on at the federal level now, and uh, welfare policy was something that I worked on from my during my college career and then for the years after that. And then I went to work for the New York State Senate and I did a lot of work around data and digital campaigning which then led me into technology. I was sort of an accidental technologist. It was not something I mean I studied something called metropolitan studies in New York, which feels like a joke now. Uh, but it was like the study of the city. And what better thing to study when you're in New York? I really yeah. studied that city hard. But I, I fell into technology and then went to work for a firm that built open source software for impact-oriented nonprofits. And I kind of thought, I have arrived so early in my career. This is amazing. I love doing this. I love the people I work with. I love the clients I work for. I love what I'm doing. And, you know, probably about like the 25th or 30th project that I did that was building a website and implementing a contact database started to get a little repetitive. And that coincided with the uh, housing crisis and uh, nonprofits are a trailing indicator of the economy. And then money started to dry up. And by 2012, I was like, okay, you know what? This is a struggle. I'm out. There were other micro and macroeconomic things that, that happened. Um, and I said, you know what? Actually, I don't yeah. love this. I don't love managing projects. I don't love sort of negotiating features between the, the client and the engineers. And I need to do something else. 
and I wanted to get back to what had been some roots of mine of working at um, on like environmental impact, something that had always been keenly important to me. And I went to work for a startup here in Seattle that provided software to utilities that helped utilities recruit rate payers to do energy efficiency retrofits. And I did the thing that mm. I knew how to do, manage projects, manage client relationships. And it didn't take me very long to realize that absent the people who I had really had developed really tight bonds with, absent the clients that I cared so much about. I mean, I worked for you know, Peter Gabriel's Witness. I worked on a project for Amnesty International. I worked on projects for labor unions, environmental organizations. It just didn't connect. And I was still in that spot mm. using skills that I had, certified scrum master, certified scrum product owner, project management and client relationship skills. But I was still in that spot where I was stuck between the client and the engineers. And oftentimes there's, there was that tension of not being able to deliver the client exactly what they wanted and really having to fight the engineers to get, you know, what the client wanted. <laughs> Not on the roadmap. Oh my yeah. God. If I hear that not on the roadmap, that, that <laughs> is just, it, it brings back, uh, you know, trauma. Um, I don't want to minimize trauma. It just brings back bad memories, I should say. So I said, I'm, I'm out. Right. I'm done. I, I'm leaving. And I went to work for a communications and PR firm, nonprofit organization, national organization called Resource Media. It was headquartered basically here in Seattle. I'd actually done some collaboration with them through a nonprofit in the food and environment space that I had been involved with. And um, I took a couple steps down the ladder to refocus on what I thought I really liked, which was communication and helping organizations communicate effectively. And I did some of those website developments and I did some data and I did some, some tech and some social media. Um, I learned a lot while I was there, and that opened up this opportunity to come work at the university first as a business communication advisor. That was in 2015. And after about 18 months, well, after about a year, as a business communication advisor, uh, the assistant dean of career management asked me to join the team. And I thought, I, what, do I, what do I know? I just told you what my career path is, right? What do I know about career management? <laughs> I've been like completely opportunistic in every move that I've made, I never had, you know, a five-year plan. But what I did know how to do and what I had been doing was helping MBA candidates tell their stories in interviews and help them develop presentation skills. And I knew I was good at that. I had been doing uh, mm. presentation skills trainings for nonprofit executives in the environmental space for five years at that point, three to five years, um, partly with resource media and partly on the side. And I loved doing it. I loved helping people grow their communication skills, learn how to present, become more comfortable in front of an audience, tell good stories. And that is what I knew I could do for MBAs because I had already started doing it. So I joined the team and then I began to like upskill myself about this career thing because clearly I felt like I had a lot to learn and, um, you know, read Designing Your Life, which had just come out in that year, basically, and learned a lot from my colleagues in career management. And uh, this is this is where I am today. Along the way, got Clifton Strengths certified from Gallup. And have really leaned into that yeah. and also went and got trained in delivering the designing your life curriculum from the folks at Stanford at the life design lab. Yeah. So if, if you go all the way back to that, to that role where you were the liaison between the client and the engineer yeah, and you said you, you had this recognition, what was there a moment where like there was probably uh, like a you know an awareness and maybe it was like this thing in the gut but at what point did the did that awareness and the decision meet and can you unpack that a little bit cuz i think that's something that i come across a lot in talking to people and working with clients yeah i was i was sitting in pioneer square here in seattle in a you know exposed brick loft like office in a 
fish tank of a conference room and just like arguing over story points. And anyone who's done agile software development maybe is familiar with the concept of story points and like how many story points was were my clients going to get in the next sprint? And I just thought this is ridiculous. I just can't believe that I, that I'm that I'm having to honestly, I felt like I can't believe that I'm having to fight for what my client wants and needs and is um, paying for, right? <laughs> you know, and I'm going to fight the engineers. Yeah. Oh, but that's not on our roadmap. And I shepherded this one complex feature set to fruition uh, that the client had really wanted and that had not been delivered yet. And when I finished that, I was like, you know what? If this is the last feature I ever deliver, I'm, I'll be fine with that, you know? And um, I had a conversation actually with the uh, CTO of that company. And, you know, he suggested that perhaps my New Yorkerness, right? was not, you know, because I am born in New York, raised in New York, spent the first 27 years of my life basically in New York, that that it might not be serving me well in this position. And it wasn't the first or last time that I had heard that, especially moving to Seattle. You know, and I think it wasn't really until I got my Clifton Strengths theme sequence and really started to understand it that I began to understand sort of that, you know, in, in Clifton Strengths, we talk about sort of the basement or the raw form of, of the theme that my activator, my command, my self-assurance and my communication when immature and raw and in their basement, you know, and I say this to students all the time, it is not a good recipe, right? It is not really a recipe for success when I'm not using those right. And the funny thing is when I got that report, I, I was visiting my parents shortly thereafter and I shared it with them and they said, you know, we recognize that what you had been doing at those tech companies didn't really play to your strengths. And what you're doing now mm plays so much better to your strengths, you know, and we're so much happier that you're doing the things you're doing now. You know, I have relator and individualization are, are, are up pretty high and I don't actually have a lot of execution in my, in my uh, dominant themes. My only execution is responsibility. So mm. my, my joke is I think responsibility mm. is the worst executing theme because the way that it shows up for me <laughs> is I basically have to make an external commitment and then guilt myself into following through because integrity is something that's very important to me. Um, so I don't like my, my little, the sort of responsibility monkey on my back, but they recognized it. And I said, why didn't you say anything? I've been working in tech for like eight <laughs> right. and a half, nine years. Why didn't you say anything? Right. And really I, I, as I've moved into this role as a career coach, a Clifton strengths coach, with MBA students, I have felt so much more just at home. Like the things that I am good at are the things that I are, well, it's what I use on a daily basis. Do you think if you would have known those five strengths back then, it would have maybe like accelerated the decision or the awareness? Um, or how, probably a better question would be, how would it have changed with the benefit of hindsight in a hypothetical yeah. scenario? Yeah. I don't think I ever would have gone to work for the tech startup in Seattle. Hmm. When I was working for the consulting company that did the open source software development, some of the things that I also did were essentially like marketing and business development and relationship development, recruiting new uh, developers to come work for us. I would attend conferences. I would speak at conferences. I would deliver training. So there was this whole category of things that I did really well that played to my strengths. And then there was this other category, the actual role of project manager or scrum master that I did that did not play to my strengths. I was really good at the kickoff meeting. Yeah. I was really good at getting that initial product backlog, you know, set up. But man, the last two sprints of a project were just grueling for me. 
Um, so I, but so yeah. there was all these things that yeah. I loved, and I loved going to the conferences. I loved meeting people, um, developing those relationships, some of which are strong relationships that I have to this day. And that really played to my strengths. And there was this other part that was like, oh, this is just what I have to do to continue to work at this company, right? And it didn't really play to my strengths. So it was like the things that I put up with. There was enough of the good to balance out the things that were harder for me, that weren't as natural. And when I moved to to the tech startup here in Seattle, there was none of that. The the conference stuff wasn't there, right? The kickoff, the the you know, working with a client, like that was there, but the being out there and social at conferences and giving presentations. Um, that was not part of my job. So the, the balance tipped. And I think I would have known that had I known my strengths when I was making the transition, like, okay, I'm going to leave this company and find something new. I would have recognized that this opportunity that I had was not going to fulfill me. And mm -hmm. I realized, you know, I probably realized in six months and it took me another, you know, three months to plan my exit. And I was, I just cut bait and it was yeah. the best thing that I ever did was to leave that company, you know, no sentimentality, right. You know, like the company was great. Mm -hmm. The people were good. They were doing good work. It just wasn't for me. And I think that was a really important lesson for me. And something that I've taken with me into my conversations with students, you know, is that you may do something, you may take a job and you may realize that that job isn't the right job for you. Well, learn from it and make your plan what's going to come next. Yeah, so Kate, that, that, you actually jumped ahead of the question I was going to ask. Do, do you find the mentality of students these days that you're coaching who, and it's exclusively MBAs, is that correct? Mm -hmm. So the MBA students, is their perspective on the job that they take? Is it, so I, I think w during our era, we looked at the job as something that would be a little bit more lasting than, you know, the, the turnover rates yeah. that we're seeing these yeah. days, like the mentality, it seems like it's shifted, but I'm curious about a student who has invested time and money and energy into an MBA coming out. What's the view? What's the perspective? Do they think this is going to be like a three-year thing or a five-year thing, or do they think beyond? Yeah, that? it's a good question. I think there's intellectually what they know because we tell them and they hear it, which is, you know, on average, an MBA candidate or an MBA, a recently graduated MBA, you know, spends 18 to 24 months in that first role before they move. And they might move role within the company or they might move from one company to another. So mm -hmm. I think on an intellectual level, you know, people hear that. But it's kind of like no one believes that that's true for them, right? Okay, that's the average. Yeah. But for yeah. me, no, yeah. I'm going to get the job that's going to be like where I work for the next 10 years, right? Yeah. Because the job, and I think part of it is that in the MBA program, the internship search and the job search is grueling. And I tell students this all the time. This is unlike any job search you have ever had before and will ever have again. And in part, that's because all these opportunities are laid out in front of you to apply for. But there are 10,000 MBA students, candidates per class year in the top 20 or 25 MBA programs, all also competing for those things. And you're in a cohort at Foster of 110-ish students who are all applying at the same time. And when you are typically job searching, you're not around 110 other people who are also job searching and getting the interview or not getting the interview. And you're comparing yourself against them like, oh my God, if that guy didn't get the interview, how am I ever going to get it? Or if he got the interview and he got the final round and he didn't get the offer, how am I ever going to get an offer? Because he does so much better than me in accounting and finance, right? Or whatever it is. So there's this comparison mm -hmm. and competition piece to it. And a lot of students, I think, develop this aversion to the job hunt, right? I want to get an internship 
and I never want a job search again, right? That internship is going <laughs> to result yeah. in a conversion <laughs> offer and I'm going to be done uh, by August, October 1st. I'm going to sign my offer to convert my internship to a full-time role. I'm going to finish out my MBA nine more months and graduate, take a trip, and then come back and start my career at, <laughs> you know, Amazon, Microsoft, Intel, Nike, Adidas, Salesforce, whatever it is, right? And be done. Yeah. I don't have to search for a job anymore, right? Yeah. So I think that's yeah. that. Yeah. That's one of the things that happens. And you know what I will remind students, especially you know if they don't get that internship offer for the thing that they really came into the program being like, I really want to work for this company that they can interview during full-time recruiting and they can get a different internship now that is sort of a, a stepping stone that is a pivot. I'm a real fan of this concept of a pivot 15 to 70 degrees towards where you want to go. We have a lot of people who are changing careers, either changing industry or changing function or changing industry and function. And sometimes you have to make a series of pivots. And uh, I have a student, oh, he was a student that I worked with for during his first and second year. And he came out of construction. He did an internship that was kind of tangential to the construction field that he had been in. And then from there, he moved into a, another role that had to do with utilities and, and but on the construction side and then he moved to a role at amazon doing the thing that he really wanted to do so it was two two steps and then he got to the role that he wanted to be in mm. and that happened in mm. less than three years right <laughs> So, you know, I think yeah. if you take that longer yeah. range plan, if you you think about this as a process of moving in the direction that you want to be in, uh, that it really helps and you you stop thinking about the high stakes nature of the internship recruiting or the high stakes nature of that first job that you get out of school. Right, right. So I know you you use strengths with the students. Do you see a follow through? And maybe you don't have view into what happens once the student signs the deal and they go into the the nine to five. But I'm curious about do they leverage strengths? You know, to amplify their strengths, obviously, in the interview process to get the job. But is there any? Um, Filtering mechanism probably isn't the right word, but are they looking for organizations that are strengths-based organizations? That that would be yeah. kind of the, the higher question. The next question would be, do you see that commitment to strengths within those organizations if you have view into what they're doing after they ink the deal and they're working in that nine to five? I wish I had that view in. Yeah. Um, I am actually, I'm speaking, speaking with an alum later this afternoon. So it gives me something to ask her. About. Yeah. She yeah. wanted to talk about designing your life. Um, so I'll talk about designing your life, but then I'll ask her if she's using her strengths. I think that some students really connect with it and have the kind of epiphany that I think I had when I had a language to describe what I'm good at and why I'm good at it. And, uh, I see, so I do see students who have these aha moments. And I have got to imagine, and I will say, you know, I'm about two and a half years into working with students on strengths, right? So some of them are in the workforce now and more are headed there, right? So, you know, maybe we check mm -hmm. back in a year or two, I'll have some more yeah. evidence. But I, I do see some students really connect with this, come to realizations and have that influence the way they think about target organizations, right? Not like, is that a strengths-based organization, but let's say someone who's really high in the relationship domain, right? They may then realize that when they're looking at companies to go work for, they wanna look for companies that have strong teams, longstanding relationships um, that, that are, much more personal companies once you're in them 
rather than let's say someone who is you know really high in execution they may and and lower in relationship they may be like no i want to go work for the company that is just going to like crank out results and i want to crank out results and if i'm on a different You're team, stick to the roadmap yeah and if, right and if i'm on a team different team every three or six months i don't care because like i don't have relator i, I don't need to like develop strong relationships with the people that i work with yeah so I suggest students consider it as that sort of talent as a talent as a lens or talent as a filter to identify right. the cultural attributes of a company that may that may really align with their strengths profile. That's powerful. So I think a, a lot of times it's about awareness, right? Self-awareness, but using it externally as a filtering mechanism. That's uh that's especially powerful. Yeah, in the I, job I think, hunt in particular. And in your experience, you know, I talked to a student, and you know, looking at this student's profile uh, theme sequence, you know, and and having talked to them about their past job experience and what they were looking for, you know, I had this moment, and I said, I bet that being around a table in a conference room brainstorming is not the kind of thing you really love. And the student was like, I hate it. <laughs> and looking at their, their, their theme sequence, I said, well, you know, communication and ideation are lower down and intellection and relator are higher up. And, um, you know, I just imagine that when you're in that experience, you feel like you can't contribute, you can't get your ideas out, and like other people's ideas probably then kind of get stuck in your head, and you're riffing on other people's ideas rather than getting your own ideas out. And they were like, exactly. And we looked at yeah. the theme sequence, we looked at the report, and now we had an explanation for this experience that the student had had in their career up to this point. And then we developed, because our students work in teams, so there's a lot of brainstorming and working around the table in teams, we then brainstormed sort of the aim it phase of career coach, of uh, Clifton Strengths coaching, uh, ways to avoid that uncomfortable situation, right? ways to stop that process, that brainstorming process, and instead perhaps suggest like a brain writing process or like, why don't we all take, you know, the night to come up with some ideas and then we can present them tomorrow as a way to interrupt the, you know, like the loudest person, the most confident person, the person who's the best communicator getting up there and sort of driving that ideation process. Um, and I think that that was really empowering to then have an understanding of why that was something that was uncomfortable and how to um, prevent being in those situations just on a day-to-day -day working basis in the program. But then also in doing informational interviews with people at companies, identifying companies where the her, this student's working style would be... Um, I don't want to say rewarded, but would be activated, right? And and where they'd be able to contribute. Right. right. You know, well, uh, for me, maybe a like having those there. moments with the students, yeah. I was going to say, okay. having those yeah. moments with students in a in a in a coaching call or conversation around Clifton Strengths. Are, those are the moments where I feel. Like, wow, I've done something good today. You know, that was, that, that gives me the, that reward, the dopamine hit or whatever that uh, makes me really excited about this work because it's that one conversation that can really change somebody's experience. It could change the course. I mean, I don't want to sound grandiose. It could change the course of their life. You know, and if I had had a conversation Absolutely. with someone like that earlier in my career, I think that, you know, it might have might have saved me about a year, year and a half of anguish around jobs. Yeah. What are you seeing on, you know, so some of the work 
that I do is connecting individual purpose to company organization purpose, mm -hmm. right? And drawing that link. So what are you seeing in terms of the filtering mechanism or the process of an MBA student targeting an organization to work for? Are you seeing a shift? So I'll, I'll paint that with a really broad brush saying, you know, like the business round table that came out a year and a half ago, redefining the purpose of a corporation. Um, and there's clearly a movement. And I think a lot of that movement is based on organizations observing that the perception of value from a millennial, uh, you know, employee has shifted. Um, and these organizations need to, to adjust and get with the times. And so I'm curious about just what you're observing there, where maybe historically uh, an MBA came out and wanted to work at you know, a firm that, and there's, this is probably still the case, but they want to work in an organization where they put in 60, 80 hours uh, a week for a couple of years, made good money, and then just kind of continued on that path versus I think there's more of an awareness of that path personally, but then also what's the ethos and the purpose of the organization. Can you unpack that yeah, a little bit? That's, that's a great, yeah, I, I will. I'll try. Um, I definitely think we have seen a shift. You know, I, I have now five years experience with the student population at Foster. And I do think that we've seen a, a, a micro generational shift. You know, I think that within any generation, there's a difference between the people who are at the front end of it and the tail end, right? So we're at sort of more at the tail end of the the uh, Gen X generation, you and, you and I. And then we look at the millennial generation and the older millennials are different than the younger millennials. And now I think we're starting mm -hmm. to see those younger millennials who really came of age after the economic collapse, 2008, nine, that recession. So I do think that they have different interests and I think that they have, are much more attuned to issues around um, climate change and environmental degradation that uh, capitalism has wrought over, you know, most of capitalism's history, right? So yeah. I, I think we see a significant number of students coming in looking for what we what we kind of call impact careers, right? And I think that yeah. MBA recruiting hasn't necessarily caught up with that. And a lot of companies, you know, I just did a session with prospective students on this very topic. And I think that at a lot of companies, you know, they don't recruit MBAs for the CSR role. They don't recruit MBAs for the sustainability role. But that doesn't mean that companies, and especially, right, with Business Roundtable and BlackRock's pronouncement in the last two years, right, that companies aren't looking for ways to have a better impact on their community, to have a better impact on the planet or less of an impact on the planet. And that you can do that in a lot of different roles that don't have sustainability in the title or don't have corporate social responsibility yeah. in the title. And that's a little bit of a jump because I think students come in thinking like, oh, I want to be a sustainability manager at company X. Well, you know, you could just be a supply chain manager there and you're working on sustainability. Right. Yeah. 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 So I, I think that's part of it. But interestingly, you know, Foster has a, a, a new dean, Frank Hodge, who has been in the position now for, I guess, it's about 18 months. And, you know, as part of the process of him taking over in the role of dean, there's been reflection on, you know, the, the brand pillars of Foster and the mission of Foster and uh, the Foster purpose statement. And I think the Foster purpose statement is really illustrative in this shift, which is that together we foster leaders, we foster insights, we foster progress to better humanity. And the subtext there is to better like humanity that. through business. I like that. Right? Yeah. So, uh, you know, I, like I think that. we're we're out there, uh, I think on the vanguard. You know, what's interesting, a decade ago, I had a bunch of friends who went to 
the Presidio School to get a green MBA or who went to Bainbridge Graduate Institute to get a green MBA. And, you know, those, I think now the green MBA has kind of been internalized in a lot of ways at a lot of business right. schools. Yeah. Right. It used to be this thing, yeah. like it was different, it was special. Right. But now, you know, it's like you go to Kroger, you go to QFC and, and the simple truth organic brand is Kroger brand, right? You know, like 10 years right, ago, right, you, right. you had to go to the co-op to get an organic bag of chips, <laughs> right? And now you can go to Kroger and buy a, a Kroger organic bag of chips, you know, yeah. Annie's mac and cheese, you know, or, or something crap. It's um, General Mills, I guess, you know, they are one of the, the largest purchasers of organic grains, uh, I think in, in America, right? Um, yeah. You know, so a lot of this stuff is being mainstreamed, I guess is what I'm saying. But when it gets mainstreamed, it doesn't right. get called out. And I think that's the challenge, right? Is understanding that, well, I can go to any company and in just about any role, I could probably have an impact on sustainability or corporate social responsibility in some way if I stay focused on that. And I might be able to, while I'm there, migrate into the, I don't want to say silo, but the channel, the swim lane that has sustainability in the departmental title or something like that. Yeah, I love that. I think that's a really good metaphor of uh, organic mac and cheese or any type of product where at one point you had to go to a specialty store. Then you probably had to go to a special section within your local, you know, grocery chain. And now it's yeah. right. It's front and center. It's, it's, uh, you know, reached it's, it's right it's on in every it. aisle. It's in every aisle. And in the same way, those societal trends are influencing, um, roles and responsibilities from the left side of the curve to the, to the middle of the bell curve. I like that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Tell me a little bit, tell, tell me a little bit about, um, Ikigai Labs and the online community that you've been building? Yeah. Uh, so Ikigai Lab is a place to increase engagement, improve well-being. Uh, we try to take this concept of Ikigai and funnel it through uh, something that I call meta-awareness and fluid awareness. So meta-awareness is looking at strengths that we're talking about and also reflective looking at your values, identifying what are my core values and using that as a foundation to make better, stronger decisions with intention. The fluid awareness side is more closely linked to emotional intelligence. Like how do I observe the moment and leverage, you know, cues, physiological cues or other cues so that I can take this emotional state and then filter it cognitively through that meta awareness. So this was, that was a whole bunch of big mumbo jumbo words. Basically it's about living with intention. Um, and I think of intention through six dimensions of well-being: social, physical, intellectual, emotional, spiritual, and professional. So if you can do this work to identify kind of what are my important values, match that with data driven, research-driven strengths, uh, talents that are internal that I can flex externally. And then where do I want to point that? Um, so within the online community, we've established a community for people who are interested in living with more intention across one or all of those dimensions of well-being. And then later this year, uh, we'll launch a platform for organizations to help organizations essentially integrate total well-being with workplace performance. So, you know, we're seeing it largely driven by work from home orders in the COVID pandemic that work life is very blurry these days. Um, so how can visionary organizations, probably not even, I used to say forward looking organizations uh, or forward thinking organizations. Now I just cross forward out and it's thinking organizations uh, I think organizations that are uh, aware and um, aware is not even the right word. Mindful is probably the right word. Uh, where my mind's going right now is a pretty interesting statistic that I saw that in 1933, the SEC 
uh, had the SEC Act, which essentially said if you want to buy ownership in a company, that company has to provide transparency into what you're buying. And back then, the value of the company was dictated by physical assets. So if I bought a, a share in a company that was represented by the physical assets or the book value. Um, you fast forward to 1977, I believe, the SEC ran this audit again. And what they found was that 80 something percent was physical assets, but 20 percent was human capital. And so that's where they started to acknowledge, wait, it is a lot of the physical stuff, but there is this human capital component. They ran it again, I believe, in 2015, and they had found that the value of the company in the S&P 500, in this case, had flipped. 16% of the value was represented in physical assets. 84% was human capital. The only thing that's required by the SEC uh, in terms of human capital to disclose is how many employees do you have? So it starts to lead this conversation around a lot of the work that we're talking about. If employees are engaged or not engaged, and 84% of the value of that company is driven by human capital or people, well, what are the organizations doing to support the attract the right people, develop those people, and retain those people? And so I think this what you're seeing is the next chapter of the business roundtable. Uh, the SEC has got guidance on principles based in terms of what uh, organizations are doing for human capital. So to bring it back to the question, what we're driving toward is how do we help organizations lead this transition of integrating uh, well-being into performance or with performance, not into, but with performance, workplace performance by connecting purpose to potential and then you know helping lead this shareholder to stakeholder movement that is going to continue to flourish and grow into the future so, sounds really powerful I, you know i couldn't help but think as you're talking about those sec statistics thinking about you know what we've seen in the stock market just in the last year with companies increasing in value new companies are like tesla for example being worth more than you know multiple incumbent car makers right and of course i was thinking of gamestop but obviously that's a different story right <laughs> but um it's 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 amazing right and i think it's actually a great way to think about the the rise of some of these companies that have just taken on such a tremendous market value and then you look at other companies you know that have well, it's like all these assets right and you know you look at airbnb versus uh you know hilton or marriott right airbnb has more engineers right. than right. amazon i think this is a statistic that that i read or a higher yeah. percentage right yeah yeah well i mean a statistic that comes out of gallup that that we probably both see frequently is you know, on average, one out of three, I think the number is up to 34% now of employees in the United States are engaged. And it's even lower globally. It's like 16% globally. Yeah. And so if you think about those numbers, and Gallup has done a, an incredible job of linking employee engagement, a metric, to every important metric that drives, you know, the financial health of the organization. So sales, profitability, attrition, safety, retention, all those important metrics. And what they've identified is organizations that have higher levels of engagement outperform organizations with lower levels of engagement. So what, what, what's happening right now with this SEC regulation is that if you have two competitors, all things are equal, but one company has a very highly engaged workforce because they're doing the right things. They're establishing the right type of culture. They've got the right types of managers and the right types of roles, people in the right roles versus the competitor company B that has low engagement. What you're going to see into the future is on annual reports and quarterly calls, you're going to see analysts that are going to start to ask questions about what are you doing within What's your engagement score or some version of that very simple question that is then going to be reflected in the stock price. So that's pretty powerful 
Because if it's a human-driven economy or a purpose-driven economy, is that, as, uh, you know, that, that probably makes even more sense. If people are connected and they're engaged, that should be reflected. It, and they represent 84% of the value, their human capital of the, of the stock price. Then that should going to be a factor within the equation for the valuation of the company. So I think that's especially exciting. It, I looked at the business roundtable stuff and thought that was an amazing point in history. And I look at this as the next stage of, of that evolution. Do you think we need to look at revamping other mem- other measures to uh, line up with this? I mean, I, I can't help but think about uh, GDP versus uh, gross happiness, right? Yeah, I mean, I think if kind of where we're, where we're moving toward is a hybrid metric that's representative of those two. And I, it, so, um, what is the name of the group? FSG is, I believe, the acronym, but it's with Porter and Kramer, you know, the, the, um, the guys out of the Harvard Business School. The shared value initiative is, you know, what they're taking to the market. It's like ESG and carving out impact investing and to the point, you know, to the point of the conversation earlier, like at what point does impact investing just become investing, right? Now it's in right. some cases the filtering mechanism. In some cases it's like a marketing ploy, but at what point do we start to recognize uh, sustainability and growth of a company is connected to something bigger than just what happens over the course of the next quarter or, or, you know, year. So I think we're moving toward that point. We're not quite there yet, but there's definitely really positive trends. So not all of the six aspects of wellness that you mention seem to fit neatly into the at work bucket. Mm -hmm. Um, Some of them are are really that outside life, right? And uh, we, I know we had a conversation about this concept of like close lifelong friends, I think called Moai. Correct. Is that right? Yeah. 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 Um, Yeah. And uh, you know, I, I couldn't help but think of it, uh, when I had a driveway moment, an NPR driveway moment, listening to a segment with the author and reporter Billy Baker talking about his book, We Need to Hang Out, which is about male friendships. Are you familiar with his work? It started out, I think, as an article in the Boston Globe. I'm not. But this idea that men, in particular men, uh, men of a, a certain age, sort of our age, have statistically fewer close connections right than um than than other demographics and definitely other than women um in in the same age group you know and i think about the community aspect of wellness and i wonder from your perspective what are some things that you see people doing to especially during the pandemic if any right to fill those gaps in social connection. There was another fantastic article in in the Atlantic magazine, I think this last week, saying that, you know, the pandemic has erased this entire category of relationship, of friendship. We have this word friendship in in English and it means so much, right? Your best friend is a friend mm-hmm. and the person who you, you know, watch the college football game with at the sports bar every weekend is a friend. But you know, they're just completely different. But that second category, those casual connections, the weak ties, right? Those have just been paired completely. Yeah. What's your, what's your take on that in, in this context of, yeah. of wellness? Um, uh, great question. Well, so probably an important distinction is wellness versus well-being. So I think of wellness in terms of physical wellness and well-being as holistic, right? Yeah. All dimensions. Um, but I, I spoke carelessly. <laughs> that's okay. It's, it's took me a while to get to that distinction myself. So social isolation, you know, there's research out there that says social isolation and loneliness is more harmful to your health than smoking cigarettes, right? So you could smoke a pack a day if you're hanging out with your friends and in theory, you would be more healthy, um, than if you are, um, the alternative. So, um, 
so back to the Moai concept that you mentioned, I'll start there and then kind of work into present. The Moai concept uh, was revealed also by Dan Butner in the Blue Zones book, um, where it's like an arranged friendship. So families who have shared values come together when the kids are around the ages of birth to five years old, and it's implicit within the culture that these groups of children will be together throughout life. And so if you think about that sense of community that's implicit with the cult, within the culture, um, these relationships provide emotional, spiritual, financial support throughout the ebbs and flows of life. And so Butner was talking to these 102-year-old women that had been together for 97 years. Right? And so if you think about that if, as it's um, implicit within the culture, and when they're going through different tough stages in life, you know, at different variables within life, and you've always got someone to count on, that's powerful. And I think in some way we've experienced, most have experienced some version of this and going, you know, as we round the corner into 12 months of, of, um, of COVID. So there's, there's a, you know, I don't know if you experienced this, but I experienced this when, when COVID first hit and it looked like, oh, we're going to be quarantined for two weeks and then we're going to go back to normal. But hey, what should we do for these two weeks? Oh, well, maybe we should get on these Zoom happy hours and connect with college friends that we haven't seen for you know 20 years. And there was a lot of that happening, which was really uh, refreshing and really rewarding. And um, so I think there, in some form, technology has unlocked this ability and this recognition that, hey, we can connect with people. Um, and those those historical barriers, whatever they were, whether it was a technology thing or just a time thing, um, had suddenly vanished. And so there was that. But then we kind of moved into the the later stages, or the you know, like this thing is much gnarlier than than we ever anticipated. And there, I think it really come at least for me personally, it came down to um, intentionality. And kind of building, um, I, so I like to like talk about EKI in terms of the ultimate definition of purpose is doing something in service of others. And that, that ties back to my great grandmother, her, her story, right? That she was doing something that was bigger than her for a, a Shinto shrine in Japan that still exists today because of, because of her sacrifices. And I think about that and I think about that in these moments that we're in right now. And a couple of things come to mind. One is three zones in life, comfort zone, panic zone in between those two is the learning zone. Right. And if we give ourselves the permission to just take ourselves ever so slightly out of the comfort zone, in the social dimension, right? So it could be something as simple as, I'm going to commit to saying hello to a stranger when I go for a walk, or I'm going to commit to sending a text to that friend that I've been meaning to reach out to for the last five years, right? And just kind of giving yourself permission to go outside of the comfort zone into the learning zone and recognizing that there's a lot of space there between comfort and panic. I think that's helpful, provides a lot more agency. And then it's just following through and committing. But if it's if it's this mentality or this perspective that um, it's a small step, it's not a big leap, recognizing that it's a small step suddenly gives us that ability to reach out or to connect, which I think is in the spirit of Moai, and Ikigai. And, and probably the last thing I'll say here is when I think about Ikigai and the way that I position Ikigai within Ikigai Lab and all the programming that we do, it's always about, uh, there's two words, jinsei and seikatsu. Jinsei what means lifetime. Seikatsu means daily life. And so if we were to ask somebody, well, what's your purpose just randomly walked on the street and said, Hey, what's your purpose? At least in the Western world and probably all around the world, most people, their mind's going to drift toward lifetime. Gene say, what am I on this planet to do? 
And when we start to frame purpose through the lens of seikatsu or daily life, it gives us a lot more control so that if we're living with intention, we're aligning actions and priorities today, and we have a week of those days and a lifetime of those weeks, then we're living our purpose on a daily basis rather than, oh my gosh, what am I on this planet to do? And why am I not doing what I'm supposed to? I can't even figure it out, let alone take action on it. When we shrink that down to the moment or shrink that down to the day and then filter that through this perspective of well-being and in particular social well-being, uh, I think it just makes it a lot more manageable. And there's a multiplier effect. So one good thing, you get that dopamine, that you know, that uh, oxytocin, that serotonin, all that good stuff, all those good chemicals, and it just has a multiplier effect where it starts to snowball into positivity. Yeah, it's like the the power of habit. The you know you, these you, these one small steps build up, right? right? I I was doing a Peloton ride this morning, and um, the uh, the title song of Rent came on, right? And yeah. it's very much the what you just said. You know, it's like how do you measure uh, a life in one year? How do you measure the you know <laughs> yeah. a year in a life? <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah that we can string these moments together and we can make a difference and we can even uh, discover that larger purpose through the smaller moments rather than, you know, oh, I got to figure this out. Let me get my notebook out and figure out what my purpose is. <laughs> right. right. I'm going to, exactly. I'm going to work. I'm going to, I'm going to solve this problem. I'm going to figure out what my purpose is. Right. Well, I think it's been a really great conversation. I want to just ask you a couple like closing wrap up questions. Well, first, where can we find out about Ikigai Lab and the work that you're doing? Yeah, uh, you can find Ikigai Lab at ikigailab.co. So that's I-K-I-G-A-I-L-A-B.co. Uh, on there, you'll find the podcast. Uh, most recently published an episode with a musician named Kishibashi, incredible story that Kishibashi plays music, has is launching a new genre called a song film about a Japanese concept called omiyari, which translates into compassion and altruism, where he plays music at um, the sites and locations of the Japanese incarceration camps from World War II. Uh, there's the podcast. There's also the free community that you can sign up for uh, on that website as well. Are there any uh, books or podcasts that you take great inspiration from that you think my listeners would benefit from? There's a book that I'm reading right now uh, called Atomic Habits by James Clear. And I'm only a couple chapters in, but I am blown away by this book. Um, so I would definitely recommend that book. You had mentioned The Happiness Curve. Uh, by Jonathan Rausch. I think that's a really profound book, especially for um, maybe not as much for for MBA students. I think that it is good for MBA students and can kind of give you some insights into into just the the path of life, if you will. Um, but in particular, for those that are kind of late thirties uh, through um, you know late fifties, I think it's especially powerful. Podcast wise, I don't. Listen, I actually, probably the uh, an advisor and mentor of mine has been really recommending Oprah's Super Soul Sundays, and so that's been top of mind lately. And I've really gotten a lot out of these. They're great conversations that Oprah has, and they're pretty short, about twenty to thirty minutes. I'm also a big fan of Dr. Michael Gervais' Finding Mastery. I haven't listened to his stuff as much lately, but I always walk away with just incredible insights. So those are two that are at the the top of the list. How about you? Books and podcasts? Oh, I, I wish that I could. I mean, I have a lot of books, but I haven't had a lot of time to read them during the pandemic because the free time has been filled up with uh, proctoring school related things <laughs> for my child. But what what I would say, you know, to, to anyone who's who's contemplating a career change, I would definitely recommend the Design Your Life and uh, Work Life books, the new the new one that just came out, and the Two Hour Job Search as a great mm -hmm. just recipe. And I had the author on my podcast, that's Steve Dalton, 
a couple episodes ago. And it's just a, it takes so much of the thinking out of the job search. It's just really just a recipe to follow. And so it's kind of like Atomic Habits because it basically just gives you an algorithm for, it is an Atomic Habit, I should say, right? That it gives you an algorithm for making your way through a job search. Uh, on the podcast front, I mean, I get a lot more time, you know, with uh, with my earbuds in listening, and I am just in. I I really appreciate the work that Dan Harris is doing with the Ten Percent Happier podcast, and I mm -hmm. find those to be yeah. so informative, especially on the, these topics around, you know, well being. Um, yeah, I also like the Jordan Harbinger show. And he has some really good guests on. And what I've started doing a bit more of is because I don't have as much time to read, when I hear of an interesting book, I go and I try and find that author on one or two podcasts and I listen to the interview with the author. Yeah, yeah. And I find that most yeah. authors tell you the most yeah. important things about their books in in the interviews. So <laughs> it's it's my little uh my little hack to to get, you know, more uh to squeeze more out of my my time. Um, and one of those podcasts that, um, I find some good authors showing up on is, um, Alan Alda's clear and vivid podcast. I don't know if you've ever listened to that. It, it's a, a great no, podcast. No. He's a, he's a really good interviewer and Ezra Klein's podcast, Ezra Klein show. Okay. Okay, cool. Well, thanks so much, Sam. I appreciate you Thank taking you. the time. Yeah. I'm glad we did. Likewise. It. I really enjoyed this conversation. And uh, this is the first home and home. I'm, yeah. I, I think it was a success. I think so too. Maybe, maybe we do it again. Maybe we do it again periodically. I would like that. You can find out more about Ikigai Lab and the Ikigai Stories podcast at conversationsoncareers.com for the full show notes. Thank you for listening to another episode of Conversations on Careers and Professional Life. I'd love to hear what you think about the podcast. You can email me at gheller at uw.edu. And if you've enjoyed this episode, please share it with a friend or classmate.